Good evening. Uh, I'm Stephen Walt. I'm a member of the faculty of the Kennedy School of Government, and it is my pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker, Javier Solana, the Secretary General of the Council of the European Union and its High Representative for Common Foreign and Security Policy. Uh, Mr. Secretary, welcome to Harvard. Most of you will know what I'm about to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. Secretary Solana has served in his current position for almost 10 years, but that is only the most recent of his many accomplishments. Originally trained as a physicist, he studied as a Fulbright Scholar in the United States, received his doctorate from the University of Virginia in 1971. He returned to his native Spain to teach and do research, eventually publishing more than 30 scientific articles. He joined the Spanish Socialist Party when it was still illegal, an act of courage most academics would probably shy away from, and following Spain's transition to democracy, became the party Secretary of Information. He was subsequently elected to the Spanish Parliament, and in 1982, following the Socialist victory in the elections, he became Minister of Culture. He later served as the government's official spokesman and later as Minister of Education. In 1992, he was appointed Minister of Foreign Affairs, and in 1995, chosen to be Secretary General of NATO. Uh, this was a challenging period in NATO's history, to say the least, as the alliance was simultaneously dealing with the protracted Balkan crisis and a much-needed effort to adapt its political and military structures to new global circumstances. Solana quickly became known as a remarkable consensus builder and his leadership helped NATO survive internal tensions during the Kosovo War and eventually adopt a new strategic concept for the post-Cold War environment. Now, the latest chapter in his career began in October 1999 when he assumed his current position. As High Representative for the Common Foreign and Security Policy, he has become the answer to Henry Kissinger's famous complaint that when he wanted to speak to Europe, he had no phone number to call. If Kissinger were in office today, Solana's number would be in his BlackBerry. As Europe's official foreign policy representative, he's been engaged in a wide array of critical international issues, including Middle East peace, post-conflict efforts in the Balkans, Iran's nuclear program, and many others. Now, Albert Einstein once explained that scientific progress was more rapid than efforts to build peace by saying that politics is much harder than physics. Secretary Solana is that rare individual who is genuinely accomplished in both realms. There is no one in a better position to discuss the topic of Europe in the world. Indeed, one might say he is the living embodiment of that title. So please join me in offering again a warm welcome to Secretary Solana. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Professor Well, for your kind, uh, kind words. Um, to be quoted uh, in relation with Einstein really produces uh, a sense of exaggeration, but in any case, a sense of, of gratitude. <coughs> I, I am delighted uh, to be back at Harvard. Uh, the last uh, time uh, that I was here, we discussed uh, whether the U.S. Uh, and Europe at that time remember Mars and Venus, how they could be reconciled. And the answer today is even more obvious than it was then. But we have uh, new issues to grapple with and a new geopolitical landscape. Again, the question is, uh, what the U.S. and Europe can and should do together. But before we answer that question, let me assess the new change, the context in which these relations are taking place. Something which are obvious, but I think is worth repeating. Our world uh, is a world in flux, one where everything is speeding up politically, economically and technologically. And the net result, as you know, is complexity which is growing. 
there is no single narrative or a single template to guide us. Chaos and hyper hypermodernity live side by side. Integration and disintegration coexist. And no wonder many of our citizens feel confused and even lost. Against this background, I think that we need to be flexible and principled at the same time. For our core values have not changed, nor has uh, our determination to preserve them at home, in our homes, and support them abroad. What is really changing the world is the globalization, you know that. It is leading to deeper interdependence uh, and probably to multipolarity. I think the globalization is good, in any way, they're pretty much unstoppable. It spreads prosperity and makes us richer culturally. It brings people together across continents, but of course it has a dark side too. It makes us more vulnerable to shocks and has brought new problems in its wake. And it needs, as has been said many times, a human face. But it's interesting, globalization is our triumph, the triumph of our ideas, not our decline. But we can no longer run the world as we used to. We have to adjust. It means the new powers are rising, while older ones are playing uh, new roles. The financial crisis has shrunk the timeline, and therefore the need to reposition ourselves is not a challenge for the medium term. It is an issue for today. And in all this, I think that is a, a paradox. In previous times, if you won a political or an ideological battle, you could expect more influence. This time, our intellectual and political victory, let me call that, require us to share the leadership of the world with others. Our success at the spreading markets, open societies, and the desire for people to share their own lives means probably less power for ourselves. And this adjustment should be embraced not resisted. To manage uh, this globalized world, you need uh, at least two things. One, well-run states. Weak states are a nightmare for those living in them, but also a problem for the rest of us. This brings me to the first big problem. Creating well-run states requires functioning politics. And functioning politics is something that foreigners cannot provide. Only the locals can provide it. We can help, but it's ultimately their responsibility. At the same time, their failures rebound on us, and this is the core for the diplomatic uh, action in this period of time. Second, we need effective governance. This is a, an awful term, governance, but it's a vital concept. Through effective global governance, we should avoid the risk of a world of multipolarity without multilateralism. But there's a second problem. Economics and security are global whereas politics and people loyalties remain local. The problem then of collective action was meant to be solved uh, through international rules and institutions, but, the, but this post-1945 international system is under important pressures, both in terms of effectiveness and in terms of legitimacy. It is in part because the nature of power itself is changing. 
power has shifted uh, from governments to markets, we have seen that, to NGOs, to the media. These days, if you want to tackle international problems, negotiation among only diplomats probably are not going to solve it. But the main reason is the power shift, roughly speaking, from the West to the emerging countries. This is the fundamental. If people are to contribute to the solution, they have to help shape the strategy. What we cannot do is to say that the world has changed and then maintain the same table of decision making and inviting those to the dessert and not for the place plate. The old maxim of nothing about us without us has resonances today. It's therefore logical that we talk so much about how to reform the different Gs, G8, G8+, G8+, plus five, G20s, but also the Security Council of the United Nations and the IMF uh, uh, voted ways to mention only one part of things that have to be reformed. In short, the consequence of the double power shift is that uh, we need to mobilize white coalitions and bring everybody on board. But then a question arises, who is responsible for what? Who defines the strategy? How do you avoid free riding behavior? Solution, this requires trust, which in turn is done through agreed rules and good politics. And here the European Union itself, it may be a good example. It started as a peace project among Europeans. Through the enlargement of the European Union, we spread the zone of peace and stability. We have a big task for the future, started today, to contribute to promoting peace and functioning politics around the world. It is 10 years roughly, since we started doing foreign and security policy in the European Union in a more serious manner. Not everything is perfect, but we are making a difference uh, where it matters. We are promoting peace and protecting vulnerable people in the Balkans, in Africa, in the Middle East and elsewhere. More than 70,000 people from soldiers to policemen, to rule of law experts have been deployed in more than 20 crisis management operations. These missions are important. They produce stability and they save lives. But they are also an expression of Europe's ambitions and identity. We do crisis management, if you allow me to say, at the European way, or in a European way, with a comprehensive approach in support of international law and agreements, and in close cooperation with partners such as the United Nations, NATO, the African Union, and others. But of course, by far, our most important international partner is the United States. President Obama has set a new direction for the US foreign, foreign policy. This has been welcomed around the world. But I would like to say that in Europe in particular, and the reasons are obvious, Europeans welcome his inclusive leadership, the genuine consultation, his principled pragmatism. New policy lines have been defined on the Middle East, including Iran, has been said, on Afghanistan, Pakistan, on Guantanamo, Today, an important statement on missile defense. And there is also a greater orientation on Asia and China in particular. And I'd like to say a word about that. This is not entirely new, but the trend has become more clear. This too is a consequence of power shift. The rise of China and its integration into the system is the most important trend in global politics, probably. 
how this unfolds will shape the world of our children. We understand very well the importance of the bilateral relationship of the United States with China. Most international issues require America and China to pull in the same direction. But there cannot be simple G2 running the world. That would betray the key principle of inclusiveness. And I'd like to say that the European Union has to be there and deserves to be there. The transatlantic relationship has been changing. The days that it was primarily, primarily about security in Europe, thankfully, are gone. It is now a partnership for action around the world. And this, in turn, requires two things. First, a shared strategy, which means a United States willing to listen. And second, resources, which means a Europe able to act. We welcome the United States commitment to working with us. But in a way, it is up to us to prove the added value of working with the European Union. Both because we can offer collectively and because of who we are and what we stand for. There are many issues that uh, require a close EU-US partnership and clear results in the months ahead are necessary. Together, we have the will and resources to do so. Let me give you some examples, the Middle East. The Middle East is a clear example, obvious. George Mitchell, the envoy of President Obama, a good friend of mine, is in the region. I was there a couple of weeks ago. We will meet again in Washington over the weekend. We are working together to create a new dynamic for peace. Allow me to repeat what I have said on another occasion on what I think about the Israeli-Palestinian dynamic for peace. It has been tried many times. It has failed all the times. I think a basic ingredient uh, for success is a real mediation. The parameters for peace are defined and well known. But the mediator, in this case probably the United States, has to set the timetable also. If the parties are not able to stick to it, then a solution backed by the international community should be put on the table. I hope very much that next week at the meeting of the General Assembly, we will have the beginning of this new dynamics. I'm not sure yet, but I hope that that will be the case. Let me go back to what I said. After the fixed deadline, I think it would be very good that the UN Security Council resolution should proclaim the adoption of the two-state solution. This should include all the basic parameters for borders around the 1967 borders, refugees, Jerusalem, and security arrangements. It would accept the, the Palestinian state as a full member of the United Nations. And uh, a calendar would be established for the implementation. All the remaining territorial disputes will be over and uh, all the claims end. The Arab community, the Arab countries, through the Arab Peace Initiative, will have to have a very active role. And I think that this is something which we are working very hard and getting, in the last hours, good responses. But uh, the Middle East is not the only place where we are working hand in hand. Let me say a word about Afghanistan. We all know why we are there, why we are in Afghanistan. Our security needs a functioning Afghan state. The obstacles to that are also very clear. A growing insurgency, the corrosive 
effect of drugs and the high level of corruption. But we need a new compact, a new contract, with whoever leads the new Afghan government after the election. This compact should clarify the commitments of both sides and should make greater Afghan ownership and accountability more clear. The, the United States is more deeply engaged than we are. But as the European Union, we are making a tremendous contribution, a very useful contribution. In aid, we have spent billions of euros, billions of euros, people, and willingness uh, and the, uh, the right conditions to do more. Security, no doubt, is a precondition for development uh, and building a state. We have deployed 30,000 troops, which is much more or more than what we deployed in Bosnia. It was the most important deployment ever by the European Union. Therefore, we are doing something of dimension. Everybody agrees that we need uh, enough uh, and competent Afghan security forces, both the army and policemen, to control the territory. And so we need to train them. We will help on that. As you know, we have a mission on the ground of police, focus on, on the police, the civilian policing. It's aimed to train the trainers. It has made good progress, has been recognized by the Afghans, and in particular by the new Minister of Interior, which is uh, somebody we can trust, and I hope very much that he will continue in the government. But above all, we must realize that they, are really, that <coughs> they really can only be a political solution. This means more emphasis on reconciliation, more emphasis on reintegration. This will be a tremendous task, a big task for the next Afghan government. We can help, but they have to lead on this. It has to, the government, to find jobs for what we may call the foot soldiers of the Taliban and make political deals with the middle ranks of the Taliban which wanted to incorporate into the process. I believe that if we send the right people who know the culture, who know history, to the right places, we could make a real different collectively, the European Union and the United States. And I hope very much that soon we'll see the new policy that uh, is to be defined by the President of the United States in cooperation with us. Since we'll have then question-answer period, I don't go any further into Afghanistan. Let me say a word about Russia. The starting point from our point of view in relation with your country must be that uh, no real security is possible in Europe without an engagement from the United States and without Russia finding its proper place in the overall European order. Since the end of the Cold War, we in the West have certainly made mistakes and missed opportunities. But Russians also have to ask why they have contributed to the prevailing mood of distrust, especially among their neighbors of Russia. Shared security requires a shared mindset, an agreement on principles, and a willingness to abide by them in practice. George Kennan wrote in his famous long telegram explaining why the Soviet Union was not supportive of the new global institution at the time, the following. Soviet power is impervious to the logic of reason, but highly sensitive to the logic of force. Today, Russia is very different from the Soviet Union, even in the wake of the World, of the world War II. So is Europe. That is why we want to believe that it is the logic of reason that drives the Russian leadership. 
And that is why we want to explore and explore deeply President Medvedev's ideas of a new European security architecture and the environment created by the so-called reset produced by the United States. We welcome the reset, including the new direction on non-proliferation and disarmament. By the end of the year, the year there should be a follow-on to the START uh, agreement, which reduced level in strategic nuclear arsenals. The world, without any doubt, will be better for that. As European Union, we work well with Russia on many global issues, like the United States, on the Middle East, which cooperated in the quartet also, on Iran, where it for, is part of the six uh, parties, uh, which I have the privilege to represent, and I will be represented once again the 1st of October, and also in Somalia, to mention some, some places. But unlike the United States, we also share a continent with Russia. And hence, the, the European Union relationship to Russia is an everyday business, from energy security to migration to the environment. Dealing with Russia has sometimes uh, been difficult for us. This is logical given the different histories of our member states, the member states of the European Union. But what matters is uh, not how a discussion begins among ourselves, but how it ends. And the European Union has ended up with the United position, for instance, on the Medvedev proposal, or uh, a United position ourselves on Georgia. And uh, I have to remind you that uh, we are the only people on the ground on Georgia since the OECE has not been allowed to continue there and the United Nations has not been allowed to continue there either. Let me recall what President Medvedev himself uh, commented on the reason for Russia's failure to modernize. He said, the endemic levels of corruption and the need to have a more open democratic system with the rule of law is something absolutely necessary for the modernization of Russia. President Medvedev takes it. I completely agree with him. But because uh, our post-modern uh, DNA of the European Union, the European Union is not well placed to respond to something that might look like uh, a great power politics. We will not be. It's not in our DNA. We are most of a post-modern type of a structure. For you, for the United States, probably it will be fine, much easier to play on the game of great power politics. For us, there's no alternative uh, to cooperation with Russia on a wide range of issues. The best way to do so is through agreed rules, whether on broader security issues or on the very crucial and important issue for us, which is energy. Let me, let me move uh, to the third issue that I would like to touch upon in our bilateral relations, which is climate change. Every time the scientists come back to us, their findings on climate change are worse. This is a planetary crisis. It is urgent. And we need to take uh, our responsibility. I'm pleased that uh, more than anyone else, the, the European Union is showing leadership in tackling climate change, both with a robust uh, set of policies at home and in pushing the international community to act. In terms of policy, we essentially need two things. First, find the right incentive to stimulate for green investment, and second, to address the global justice dimension. I am concerned that this issue of climate change, like maybe also proliferation, is being cast as a north versus south problem. You create it, you solve it. 
yes, the, the rich uh, created the problem. And yes, the poor are the most vulnerable. But this is a problem that cannot be solved without everyone contributing. In a way, it is a problem for everyone that half of all the people that were ever alive are alive today. All this makes a comprehensive deal in Copenhagen at the end of the year essential. We need ambitious targets, well-functioning cap and trade systems, and more money for developing countries to help them reduce their emissions and cope with the inevitable. On targets, I welcome the latest commitment by Japan. I think it's important. And I hope that uh, the United States will also follow suit. We realize and understand that uh, domestic political circumstances are difficult. But if the United States does not move, China and India probably will not move either. And we have to break this mutual suicide uh, pact. A generous and credible deal on financing is not only a part of a large deal. It is a way to get in. I know it may sound impossible in the middle of a serious economic crisis, but it's the other way around to my mind. Investment in green technology will be key to overcome the crisis. It will be key to see the development in the post-crisis. I don't think I'm dreaming. I think it's feasible. The European Union is committed to pay its fair share. You know that. And next week in Pittsburgh at the G20, we will see how much everybody is willing to contribute. Let me try to finish. There is a new mood in the US-European relations, but also a doubt in the agenda. We have gone through some of the issues. All the issues from the Middle East to Afghanistan, non-proliferation, disarmament, energy, all are different, but all are difficult, and all come at the same time. The way to, the way to solve these problems is, by, to my mind, by good politics. And what do I mean with good politics? For me, good politics involves Patience, empathy, integrity, creativity. It is about reestablishing trust, about focusing on the future and not in the past, in the wider horizon, not on the narrow one. Good politics, to my mind, requires an ability to charm, to move, to mobilize, to persuade and to cajole even. Some see a world full of growing, intractable problems. I see a world of uh, negotiable conflicts and new opportunities. If we apply ourselves and practice what I have defined as good politics, we can solve the conflicts and seize the opportunities. And I think together, the European Union and the United States the United States and the European, plus others, no doubt, have the obligation to do it. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Uh, in my time, the Secretary of NATO was no connection whatsoever. Uh, today, we meet, uh, I mean, every month at regular formal meetings, and I meet with the Secretary General. Uh, he asked about every other day or on the telephone. Now, it is true there is a problem, it's still left. We solve, it was my time, the Berlin Plus agreements, you know, which is the possibility of the European Union to act with means that belong to NATO. But uh, what we don't have now still is what happens with the European Union acts outside the Berlin Plus framework. That means alone. Put you an example. We have been in the Republic of Chad in Africa. We have been in DRC, in Congo, in Africa, without this format. And we are now in Afghanistan and in Kosovo outside that format. And that is the problem. Because it's a block in, and I say to say the truth, in NATO, not in the European Union, in NATO this time, that does not allow for agreements because one country blocks the agreements of cooperation on the ground on this type of operation. I hope that that will change, but for the moment has not changed. I know this dossier very good, very well, because I was the one in my second position who made the changes of letters with NATO on this uh, non or beyond Berlin Plus action by the European Union. That, it doesn't make life impossible. It makes life a little bit more difficult because it will be very difficult to understand that the citizen, I mean, a, let's say a soldier from the European Union, which is in Afghanistan, outside NATO, is, this is a, it's not, it doesn't exist. But yes, a policeman, he will not have the same uh, guarantees of security by NATO forces that if he, that policeman be, belongs to a country like uh, Turkey, for instance. Uh, that is a problem. But uh, I hope very much uh, that uh, the dimension is not that big. It's more of a political uh, uh, position, more than a real, a real uh, difficulty in, in practice. We try to avoid that by agreement that we sign between the commanders, and, and uh, it makes things more difficult but it's still not impossible. It is true that uh, the turnout on the, ele the election to the Parliament, uh, the European Parliament, always have been low. It's not a um, novelty, the, the, the last one. Now, what I think is very important is we approve, if we approve, and I hope we will approve, the Treaty of Lisbon. And as you know, the moment of truth is uh, the 2nd of October, in a few weeks. The polls of today give uh, a very broad uh, majority to the yes. I hope that that will be the case. That will change, in the right direction to my mind, some of the basic uh, questions that you have, uh, you have put. Uh, not a question of legitimacy, completely, but in part because the double majority, uh, the, the co-decision will be practically in all the domains of the action of the European Union. That will give more legitimacy to the action. And uh, in any case, uh, it will be uh, more developed, the action in foreign policy and in security policy with important changes. So I hope very much that this is the case, uh, and I, as I said, we will see it in, in the question of weeks. It will be, no doubt, uh, a much more efficient manner to act. And we are acting now, as I said, we have uh, 30,000 soldiers in Afghanistan, for instance. And this is uh, with problems, no doubt. Problems in many parliaments, national parliament, because sending forces abroad will always be a national decision. Always. 
we cannot impose on a country to send forces abroad. But um, there are difficulties, but no more difficult that you can find in other countries, for instance, in this one. In the debate that is open, it's a difficult, difficult debate, no doubt about that. Well, I, I, I said what is, uh, is evident, no? that has, has been a failure. It was a failure, well, the, only, the only, after Oslo, with Madrid, it was a previous, uh, was a good, uh, good uh, but it was a long time back. Then Camp David was, uh, was impossible. I have uh, the sentiment, after having been engaged uh, for a long time from the Madrid conference, imagine, that I see a window of opportunity, even with all the difficulties. But I think there are new situation in the Middle East, the pressure of Iran, for instance, a new one. And I think that is uh, the possibility of uh, doing something on the dynamics that I have uh, defined, create a new dynamics. I think that uh, the, the fact that uh, and this is very important, because the United States is a very important player, from the very beginning, from the very beginning of the new administration, uh, somebody of the caliber of George Mitchell was appointed. I think that the speech of President Obama in Cairo was very important. Uh, I think that uh, the, the interview that he gave to a television, I happened to be in Cairo that night, it was night there, and it was, uh, I, I saw the, the sentiments in the, among the people. I think there is a possibility. It's not, uh, it's not going to be easy. But that's why I say, and I say it, I want to repeat it, that uh, it let the two parties alone to negotiate without any kind of mediation, without any kind of catalytic effort, I think will lead to the same place where it has led in the past. And therefore, I, I, I say very clearly to everybody that uh, the process of mediation will be necessary and the time limit for those negotiations would be necessary. And I think we have the possibility of doing it. <clears throat> I, I like it very much, the concept. I know I have worked with Marie Calder, uh, which uh, has written a lot about that in the London School of Economics. And uh, but still, a lot has to be done to, to, to get the concept more clear. But I think the tendency is, is very clear, that this is the way in which we are going. This is where the essence of what I have said. In the, I mean, we have not talked too much about the specific crisis uh, management operations, because it will would be too technical for all of you, but uh, I think that that concept is a, a rich concept. We have uh, still a lot of, an, uh, of potential to be brought out of it. Um, we, will, we have every year a meeting on, with Mary Calder and the team in the, in the London School of Economics, and um, the next one will be at uh, this, uh, before the end of this year, and we would like to produce something more precise by the year 2010, the end. But you mentioned the uh, two countries, Georgia and Ukraine. I know very, those countries very well. I work with them, as you know, very, when I was in the, in the 
beginning of the Orange Revolution, that those days I was the one who negotiated the, the possibility of President Yushchenko to go to the to repeat the elections. I will not uh, discover any secret uh, because they know it uh, that I I feel frustrated with Ukraine, the manner in which they have governed themselves from that period of time until now is not really splendid, to say the least. Now, we have with Ukraine a very important partnership, but I don't see membership of the European Union in the foreseeable future of Ukraine. Ukraine knows that. Both Julia Timoshenko and Viktor Yushchenko know that. About Georgia, I can say the same. We have an association uh, agreement, which is a, a legal relationship, it's very profound uh, as far as the economy, trade, etc. But I don't see uh, Georgia of today in my future as I look ahead in the European Union. I will see very close with very profound relations both countries because are fundamental, but um, not as members immediately of the European Union. I don't discover any secret, uh, they know it. Well, the, the relationship between the United States and China is, is um, more is larger, uh, not because of the level of trade, or the, which is not very different, probably, but um, I, if I quote uh, the Secretary of State, you are a banker, uh, therefore you have a very important relationship with China. Um, um, uh, for the moment, it's not our bank. <laughs> Um, what uh, I want you to tell what, what else can I tell you? I mean, the tendency, if you take verbat in some of the President Obama expressions for the 21st century, you may think that uh, they are talking about uh, a G2 as the solution of all the problems. I don't think that is possible. And as I said, I think that is uh, first impossible. And second, I think we will go against the uh, inclusiveness which is necessary with many other important important players. As I said, I'd like to say it, I have lived many G8 meetings. And it's, it was very humiliating. Three years ago, two years ago. I don't want to say last year because it was a little bit different with being in Italy and with all the, <laughs> the things that happened. But let me tell you that uh, by the time you finish to write a uh, draft the communique and being approved by eight. You have outside China, uh, you have outside India, you have outside Brazil, you have outside Mexico waiting for you to finish. Uh, this is impossible to continue. Therefore, either we enlarge the table, G8 plus five. I don't know, I, I'm not going to define what is the best uh, geometry. And if it's only one geometry, maybe geometry is for different, different issues. But there's no doubt that that has to change. But I don't think the model could be two. That is way too little. Thank you. Well, I, I, I didn't dwell on that issue long, but I, I said very important things about that. <laughs> Let me start by the last one. I think that what has happened today on the missile defense, the decision taken by the administration, I think is a good news. I think that uh, next week, when President Obama will chair, or will not chair, but will be in the table 
of the Security Council of the United Nations with uh, the United Nations Security Council at that level of presidents discussing under the leadership of the United States on non-proliferation and disarmament is a fantastic uh, event. The reset with Russia is a very important step in the right direction. Remember that in the last eight years, only one treaty was signed and not quite uh, complete. So I think it's very, very important. Now, last thing I would like to say, which is very important, the year 2010 will be the, another revision of the non-proliferation treaty. The NPT is a fundamental element of the structure of, 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 of nuclear security in the world. The NPT, the NPT is a treaty that comes from the 70s. Every five years has to be renewed. All the times that have been tried to be renewed or to be upgraded has failed. I hope very much in 2010 will not. Let me tell you um, in which I base my, my confidence that that will be the case. A few hours ago, was the, about, I think it was 11 in Europe, in Vienna. You know what, what is in Vienna, the agency. A very important resolution has been approved today, four, year, four or five hours ago. A resolution that has been uh, very importantly negotiated by two countries that nobody would expect to negotiate a resolution, in, which is Egypt and Israel. It has been a resolution uh, in which a lot of things are said about uh, the Middle East in relation with uh, nuclear weapons. It has been uh, uh, approved by consensus with one abstention, only one abstention, which has been Israel, but has participated without any amendment. I think that uh, we are taking very important steps and uh, very complicated issues on this direction. I think that uh, the President Obama has, uh, has created a, a new dynamic, which I think is very good. I mean, the European Union as such, collectively, we are not uh, nuclear powers. We have some nuclear powers within the European Union. And uh, the nuclear powers which within the European Union will be in, in that direction also. So I think it will be the possibility of creating a dynamic in, in, that, uh, in the direction of disarmament, and, and it will be very, very important. Okay, I, I, I think you have, uh, well, I don't want to, uh, probably you follow the, the polls with more than I do, but I don't think the moment in which that tendency was the assassination of Jinjik. Um, the tendency was uh, going up and continues to go up, uh, was going down before that, before the assassination of Jinjik. It was a terrible, terrible event, terrible catastrophe. Now, with, with Serbia, we have uh, now a relationship which is um, practically normalized. Uh, still, we have, as a precondition to full normalization, what we may call full cooperation with the International Tribunal. That means, uh, as you know, Mladic. Karaj is already in The Hague. But uh, we have moved in all the other directions uh, all the way to the end. In fact, uh, we have uh, now 
the association stabilization agreement, which is the name that has the agreements with the countries of the region, of the Balkans, uh, approved. We support uh, uh, President Boris Tarik, uh, he's a good, good friend. What mistakes we have made as European Union? I don't know. Really, I don't see much or many mistakes as European Union. Uh, I see something that it was uh, very dramatic was the, the, the war of uh, the Kosovo War. And um, that is something that is still in many people is, uh, is uh, in their heart. But uh, I have lived one of the most beautiful experiences of my life. I mean, I was burned, uh, my face was burned in the streets of Serbia, I don't know how many times, thousands of times. But um, I have been in Serbia, in Belgrade, thousands of times after that. I've been working with all the leaders of Serbia, f I don't know how many meetings. Uh, I, for me, have been a really a tremendous experience to work with them, and I do personally whatever I can to, to move. And what does it mean to move, to get it closer to the European Union? Croatia, it goes a little bit more advanced, as you know. And since the weekend, a little bit more advanced because Slovenia and Croatia have arrived to an agreement on the negotiation. But I, I think uh, that Croatia and Serbia should be in the European Union close to each other in time. I, I, I don't see a, a European army in the sense of European army which uh, marches uh, uh, under the European flag. I think we are in a different business. We are in the business of crisis management. And for that, we need uh, military capabilities. But uh, I don't see in many years uh, the possibility of a European army in the sense that you have described. The new treaty, it contemplates the possibility of moving in that direction of a defense policy, but uh, most of the countries of the European Union, not all, but the majority, are members of NATO and they are bound through the Article 5 of Common Security. Uh, therefore, uh, I don't see those countries uh, creating a, a structure of an army parallel to the component they have for going to war, which is the Article 5. So keep in mind that we are, we need military components and military structures because we have to do operations which are related always to the application of the resolution of the United Nations to do peacekeeping even peacemaking in different, in different countries. That is done, and we do it, uh, and we will continue doing it. But I don't see um, an army marching on under the flag of the European Union in my lifetime. Smart progress in the European Union and I'm a constant of the new initiative of uh, 
Well, Turkey is a very, very important country. And in these weeks, we have seen many, many important things uh, that have happened uh, in Turkey. For instance, the new uh, relationship with Armenia, which is beginning to be a possibility, a reality, that may also help to resolve the problem of Nagorno-Karabakh, which is there for a long time. I have seen Turkey playing a very important role between Syria and Iraq, and I was uh, that day in, in Damascus when, when that happened, and I saw how much uh, the representative, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs from Turkey was uh, working in that direction, continues doing it. They would like to play a role with Iran also. But having said that, which is a very important thing that Turkey is doing now, as far as the relation with the European Union, you know that it's a candidate. Turkey is a candidate, and we are open chapters. The speed at which the chapters are being opened is not the speed of light. <laughs> <clears throat> you don't have to, to I mean, you read the newspaper, you see what uh, members of the European Union do think about that, about the rhythm, and about even about the end state. But always will be a very important, uh, the relationship between the European Union and Turkey will be fundamental. What is uh, what rhythm the structure is, is finished? I cannot tell you, but it's fundamental. Now, I think that uh, one thing that uh, we have to understand, and, and, uh, and you have to understand, in Turkey is a very large country with a population growth that goes uh, increased it very much. The biggest country in the European Union is Germany. It has now, after the unification, 80 million people. We are not talking about uh, getting Turkey in NAFTA or in a trade agreement. We are talking about putting Turkey into institutions with voting rights, with representations, etc. Imagine that uh, in some years Turkey will be bigger than Germany in population. Now, you have to understand what uh, the significance of having in the European Parliament, for instance, the biggest political party, the biggest uh, Turkey. That is something that uh, you think that it was already a difficulty for France to go from 60 million to 60 million, from 60 to 80. Remember that the Nice, the nice Treaty, mm -hmm. you probably you know what I'm talking about. You can imagine what uh, are the difficulties when you're talking about that. Again, we are not talking, uh, when I talk with some of our American friends, uh, they think that uh, this is NAFTA. <laughs> this is not NAFTA. <laughs> NAFTA, we did NAFTA a long time back with Turkey. Turkey said the NAFTA with the Europeans is the 1950s, <laughs> 60s. <laughs> Now is a completely different uh, jump into the political scheme. That is not an easy, an easy jump to do, but uh, there are people which uh, are very much in favor. I'm one of them. Others, as you know, are less in favor. It's a very interesting question. I would like to, I, I, I've been in Minsk three times. And I've been with Lukashenko tete a tete four times, something like that. And um, we did a, a very discreet negotiation with the United States, by the way, never appeared, in the, but within the agreement and within cooperation with the United States, uh, to see how um, some of the problems after the detainees, you remember, all that uh, part of the story. Now, we solved that problem. The, most, uh, the, the leader that was in jail was liberated. Uh, now, when the economic crisis arrived, uh, Minx entered into a very complicated situation. And um, it was interesting because Lukashenko came to ask uh, to me 
to ask if we could mobilize the IMF for the credit. It was a surprise. And um, we began to work on that and uh, with the United States and with other countries, and it was given. And for them, uh, for, uh, for uh, Minx was a very important event because for the first time they could go to Moscow and say, well, I asked for money, but I have already some of the money that had been given by the IMF. Now, Lukashenko, apart from that moment on, is uh, moving in a much softer manner. Uh, today or yesterday was in Lithuania. Just I think it was. Um, he's not allowed to travel. He's not welcome to travel in, in many countries, but he's allowed to travel. He's allowed. He had a ban, a ban on a visa, but now he doesn't. He doesn't have it. Now we're going to have a problem because uh, in the coming period of time, because the the pressure that they are receiving to recognize Abkhazia and South Ossetia is growing up from, from Russia. For the moment, they have not done it. For the moment, none of the countries that uh, Russia expected that they would recognize immediately South Ossetia and Abkhazia have done it. They've done it in Venezuela and Nicaragua. Uh, none of the Central Asian republics, and we, they are not going to do it. And um, Belarus has not done it. And um, Voronin in Moldova didn't do it either. But the pressure is going up, and I don't know if we may have uh, something of that nature. That will create a certain tension, because he, Lukashenko is part of the Eastern Partnership, with Georgia's part, Ukra uh, Ukraine's part, Moldova is part, all these countries of the Eastern part of Europe. I don't know how we'll handle that situation. But in any case, the relationship is better, it's getting better. And uh, we meet uh, periodically, and uh, we try to reconstruct a relationship with the hope that uh, it will contribute to the evolution of the country. Well, that is, that is an agreement taken, but taking the treaty, in the Lisbon Treaty, you see, if it's approved uh, in the coming weeks, it will be a reality, and we will start working in that direction. It will be a diplomatic, uh, sort of a diplomatic representation of the European Union, which is something that doesn't exist now. <coughs> now there exists part of the representation, which is the economic aspects but it will be also a representation, full representation, with all the political aspects, etc. And um, with that, uh, it's not uh, difficult to imagine that it will be one of the most important uh, diplomatic services, the United States, China, the European Union, Russia. It will be a very important one. That it will not be done in 24 hours. There will not be a big bang. It will take some time. It will have to, 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 to do it with care. Uh, the countries will have to select their people and uh, arrange it, but it will begin to move uh, the 1st of January of the year 2010. But again, let me repeat, not as a big bang. It will be something will take a certain period of time to get it in place. But this is one of the objectives, the most important, one of the most important objectives of the Treaty of Lisbon. Well, I have uh, 
I have to negotiate with them, so I prefer not to say who is the most responsible. Um, it is true that Bosnia has not moved uh, at the speed that we expected. When, when I mean we, I mean myself, or the European Union and the United States. I think we have, uh, my, my position is, which in this I disagree with the, the United States and some of the line. I think it's the, the fact that uh, Dayton still has Bosnia as a protectorate, I think that it's been too long. And the leaders of the country do not have the sense of responsibility themselves. And they have a special representative from the international community with the so-called bond powers that could change laws, could uh, dismiss people. Now, remember the year in which data was signed. A lot of water has gone through the, through the breaches of the, of the Danube. We are trying to change that and trying to get uh, a transformation from the Dayton scheme with a special international representative to something much more modest. That will be to begin to transform that into a European perspective with a special European Union representative, but with full responsibilities for the leaders. Now, the Constitution cannot be changed at this point in time. Again, I disagree with those who think that the Constitution should be done before the elections in 2010. It will not be time to do that, and I think it will be a mistake. But we have to probably get some of the parameters for the change of the Constitution. And on that, we are working and we would like to do it before the end of this year. Now, we have some disagreements with the... With the United States, some disagreements, but I think we can get uh, an agreement in the coming period of time. So if, see if we can, before the end of the year, uh, get a new push in the direction of, one, uh, create the parameters uh, that comply with the, I'm going to be technical, I'm sorry about that, but you probably understand the five plus two conditions, uh, some conditions that we put a uh, long time back, and one is not uh, still fulfilled. Um, and then see if we can agree on some of the parameters for the future constitution after the elections. But it's true that, uh, and I have to say it clearly, the rhetoric of the leaders in Bosnia, uh, it looks back, it doesn't look forward. It's a country that uh, is, in a way, at least the rhetoric, because of the lack of responsibility. The prime minister told me the other day, not very long ago. He told me, well, if, if I call my ministers and a special representative of the international community calls the minister at the same time, they will go there and not here. And this is something that he was told to me with Vice President Biden to my left, or to my right, I don't remember how we were sitting. It's the only country in which uh, a representative of that level of the United States and of the European Union have been together addressing to the leaders together. I was with Vice President Biden one whole day in Bosnia talking with every single leader separately and then together. Give them then a clear roadmap. But uh, still, <laughs> they are not moving. It's good for us, it's good for you. <laughs> we can be eager to tell you. Uh, now, the United States uh, supports Turkey a very great deal. My question to you is, what is the European position of, about the Northern uh, Cyprus uh, problem? I, have, I had lunch today with a group of uh, uh, members of the Kennedy School. 
I hope they're not here because yeah, they're, yeah, they're yeah. here. <laughs> I'm sorry, Papoulias, I'm sorry to, to bore you once again. I, like, I would like to transmit to you, if I were to choose uh, a problem that I would like to be resolved, uh, before the end of the year, I will say Cyprus. If we resolve that, it's not the European Union responsibility, it's the United Nations. I mean, we can help, but it's the United Nations. It has a mediator now, which is making some progress, but it will clarify so much the air in so many issues that some of them are, we are not aware. But uh, it will be so important that uh, I pray and plead the Secretary General to keep on pushing uh, to the solution of that problem. And Madame Papoulias, I'm sure, understand very well what I'm saying. Um, the poll president, uh, yes, <laughs> uh, and soon. Uh, the Czech president will take a little bit more time. <laughs> but uh, the time, I mean, I, I mean months, but he, he, will, he will try to complicate the, the situation as much as he can. I mean, as you know very clearly, it's a Eurosceptic uh, of great dimension. <laughs> I mean, uh, Mrs. Thatcher would be uh, a student uh, compared to her. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he will try to do the utmost not to sign. But, uh, well, we'll be forced to sign by the, the Supreme Court and they will sign, and he will sign soon. So I don't, I don't uh, if, if, the, if the referendum is done, and I'm probably in Ireland, um, it will be in Poland, no doubt, and in the, in the Czech Republic also, but it will take a little bit more, uh, it will be some uh, cons consultation to, to the constitutional court or something like that, but in a question of weeks, not a question of, uh, of many months, no. It will be in the dynamics. I hope very much that today's decision will not change uh, today's decision will not be, will not, has not made very happy President Klaus, uh, as you know, <laughs> because he has made a statement very clear. You know what decision I'm talking about. No? The Prime Minister has been much more uh, reasonable. The point is that the, this government is uh, a government which is, uh, as you know, it is not a government elected. It's a government uh, that is a, take, a caretaker government and the elections have to take place, and that is what the President of the Republic can disturb a little bit the times and uh, complicate a little bit, but not, not much. It's a good, uh, it's a good person at the end. Well, as you know, this is, this is a process that started a long time back. I think that the, 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 the part of the process that was, uh, to me, uh, the better one was when uh, the time with Larry Gianni, which now is the president of the parliament, was in charge. That was the moment in which uh, Iran returned to uh, cooperate with agents in Vienna in a much uh, more... Uh, a profound manner than today, but um, we put on the table the last proposal, was well, the second one, and uh, Larigiani, as you remember, after a, a visit of uh, President Putin to Tehran, was uh, thrown away. And the new negotiator is less uh, uh, 
uh, how would I say, it? It a nice man and all this, uh, suppose I say all the good things that have to be said about everybody, but he's less uh, independent, if I may say. And um, I think the, the news now, the, the, the thing which is new, which I really, to tell you the truth, I didn't expect to come at this point in time. Uh, when uh, they produce a paper, which is not an important paper, but the important thing is this paper. That means that they wanted to re-engage. And when we got in touch uh, telephonically, because we have done it telephonically, and I offered to meet uh, the first, the sooner the better, because that was the agreement of the six countries, uh, we had an agreement to meet on the 1st of October. Is Ramadan, at the end of Ramadan, was at the end the week of the General Assembly, which he didn't want to meet, and then the, the, the next week. Now, what do I expect? I don't expect much from the first meeting. The, what I expect from the first meeting most is that there will be a second. The first meeting is the first meeting that comes after the elections, and the first meeting after the United States will be present physically in the negotiation. During the Bush administration, I was supported uh, by the United States, but from outside. And they never sit on the table, well, once, and the last one. And now they have the commitment to, uh, they know, that Iran knows that it will be an engagement from the United States. Let's see what is the parameters, what, how much it changes their, their configuration for the negotiation. But I cannot, I really don't know, because I have not uh, seen them physically since the month of June uh, year ago. So the rest have been contacts, informal contacts, but uh, the last negotiation was in Geneva in June. So I cannot be more specific at this point in time. I don't know how will be the, 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 the mood, how will be the position. I don't know if I, if I understand the question. Yeah. Okay. The migration policy. The, the immigrant, the migration policy of the European Union is common now, and. Uh, and it has, uh, uh, as you know, we have the majority of the countries of the European Union have common borders. And therefore, the, the so-called Schengen Agreement, you enter in a country, you can move to any other country of the European Union without borders. Now, this is a big problem with migration, as you can imagine. And therefore, this is uh, one of the biggest issues that we have and in which the, the policy has to be uh, still mm, refined. We still don't have uh, a policy which is uh, completely finalized on that issue. Now, what we try to do is to construct relations with the countries in Africa, um, where the majority are, well, you have chosen Spain, Spain comes a lot from, from Ecuador or from Latin America, but, uh, most of them are from Africa and to the European Union, to get with those countries a special relation with the countries that are the, the ones who have more uh, migrants and help them, uh, help them and, and get agreement with them. But it's a complicated issue that uh, the solution is uh, still 
to be finalized. Mexico, US, it's a very difficult, very, very difficult situation. Now, if, if you look at one of the things that I didn't say at the beginning, but uh, I'm sure that you know it by heart, if you, if you look at the, uh, the population changes from here to the year 2000 and whatever, 32, uh, 2030 or whatever, in, um, in Africa will be half of the population below 18 years of age or something like that. So imagine what is going to be, the problem which is going to be for, for, uh, for Africa to produce the sufficient uh, education, etc., and also for the neighboring countries, uh, among them the European Union, which will be a tendency of migration of, of proportions which, uh, which we don't know today. Problem. I cannot give you the, the 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 answer with precision of how it will be done. We'll have to do the last question. A woman right there. <laughs> well, you, I can tell you that uh, we have been talking about many countries uh, of the Balkans. Albania is a member of NATO. If you were to ask me a few years ago if uh, at this very moment I could tell you that Albania is a member of NATO, I would say you are dreaming. It's a member of NATO. And uh, others are not. Serbia is not. Uh, Montenegro is not. Uh, uh, Skopje is not. So, I think I answered your question. It's pretty close. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll just say goodbye to everybody and uh, uh, clap again and then we'll uh, be done. Um, Uh, th there is still sometimes a debate about whether or not Europe has a foreign policy. I think what we learned this afternoon or this evening was that at least, at the very minimum, Europe has a foreign policy agenda, uh, quite a lengthy one, as a matter of fact, and fortunately is someone very capable in charge of it. I also want to offer my compliments to the very uh, people who uh, asked the terrific questions, especially the students, and if I may be slightly prejudiced, especially the students from the Kennedy School, <laughs> who, who asked such great questions. In any, in any event, please join me in thanking Secretary Solana again for a great presentation.